edition of the Big Game James Show on iHeartRadio. I'm your host, James F. Thomas IV. And as you know, uh, football season is still months away. I'm not trying to be Captain Obvious here. But that hasn't stopped people from talking about it, from the so-called deflate gate, you know, to the draft. Back on this deflate gate thing for a second. I mean, seriously. <laughs> We're still on uh, deflate gate, the draft. People are just abuzz about football already. This is just amazing, uh, an amazing time of the year, every year. Um, it's almost like the presidential elections. Like, people just get on these bandwagons. I mean, people just jump on these things, like, so early. But uh, baseball's barely a month in, and people are um, people are already talking football. So we came up with an idea here at the Big Game James Show, and an idea to prime you for the upcoming football season. Yes, we're caving in on the, on this early hype bandwagon, on this train. This you know we're jumping on this bandwagon, and we came up with an idea to uh, prime you for the upcoming football season with a series of shows dedicated to educating our listeners. On the history of football, you know, of course, it's one of the things we do around here is uh, history, as you know. And so without further ado, we'll we'll begin with uh, part one of our multi-part series. We haven't figured out how many series there are going to be yet, but there's at least three or four in the making because we got the college game to discuss, the pro game to discuss, and of course, the history right here, sort of the beginnings, the core of it all. That you know broke out in, into the uh, professional and college games later. Conflation of soccer and, rug, or, and rugby. So the game of American football. I'm going to refer to this as football hereafter. But to start this out, because there needs to be a, a distinction right here in the beginning. The game of American football, hereafter referred to just as football, developed out of something like a cross between the association of football or soccer or football, and rugby, obviously rugby. I mean, it's a, you know, rugby still that sort of, you know, that, that essence sport, you know, the finesse of, uh, and, the, and the crossing between smash mouth ethics and, and uh, you know, finesse ball games. Um, rugby itself grew out of the soccer tradition, however, uh, over in England. So soccer is truly at the very core of this sport, hence football. But uh, again, just a reminder, anytime I refer to football here on out, we're referring to American football in, the, in this series. However, as both games made their way across the Atlantic, they were both played at colleges and universities, and out of those two games, football was born. The earliest history of the sport tells us that no single variety of the game was played. Some schools played essentially soccer, others rugby, while still others played various combinations of the two, and certainly without any formal rules. Here's how the timeline works out, or roughly how the timeline works out. In the 1820s, Princeton and Harvard, joined by Dartmouth in the 1830s, were each playing different variations of this game. At this point in the history of football in America, the games were still mob style with huge numbers of players and very little in the way of rules. So not surprisingly, this free for all version, this you know, violent version of play was extremely extremely violent in the into in in, in its most extreme and as extreme as you can think. I mean, it was just a violent smash mouth go out and beat the living tar out of each other. Uh, type of game, resulting in serious injuries that led to its banishment, or rather, it led to it being banned um, first by Yale in 1860, and then Harvard a year after in 1861. But even even as the game was being banned at the college level, it was it was quickly being embraced by these these uh, prep school kids, you know, those violent little rascals, mostly in the northeastern part of the United States. Now, the, the, um, that still hadn't gotten, gotten with this, um, within shouting distance of the game that we watch today, but it's starting to, it's starting to develop, you know, these mobs of people essentially fighting over a ball. Um, as noted with the early college versions, not everybody used the same format. And at that point in the history of American football, 
There were kicking games, more like today's modern soccer or football, whatever. I mean, whatever you want to call it. And uh, running and carrying games, like sort of we, we start to see a conflation of all these into one big old violent game. No one had yet come up with what has become the centerpiece of modern American football, the forward pass. We'll get to that later. The next step was again made by schoolboys. Um, really bored schoolboys that maybe didn't want to do their homework. This time, the schoolboys of Boston, who played a form of football on uh, Boston Commons that included both running and kicking. That is, it was more like rugby than it was soccer. So not surprisingly, this hybrid version of American football became known as the Boston game. Much like over in baseball, there was a distinct uh, dis- distinction, distinction, sorry, between the New York game that we know today and the old Boston game that included soaking or, or, be, or bean balls to get people out. Um, so in 1862, they organized what was known as the Oneida Football Club, thought to be the first formal football club in the United States of America. The Boston kids got some press coverage as a result. So this hybrid version began getting a little bit of traction uh, by way of what people would come to find out about the game through the local newspapers. Still, when the college boys decided to uh, give it another try in the late 1860s, they stayed primarily with the kicking game and Rutgers versus Princeton, the uh, first noted game, played, uh, or, or at least what is kind of accepted as the first noted game, played on November the 6th, 1869. Although it was more like soccer, more than the game that we know today, um, it is usually considered to be the first game of intercollegiate football played in the United States. And what is commonly billed as the first college football game, the game was played under modified London Football Association rules. For example, players could only kick the ball and not touch it with their hands, and each score, called a goal, counted just for one point. And for the record... Rutgers beat Princeton 6-4 to four in that first contest. However, unlike soccer, there were 25 players on each side, not the usual 11 that we know. Um, this first college game was essentially soccer, but nevertheless laid the groundwork for the modern game as we know it today. So in order to do that, however, rules would have to be put in place to truly differentiate the sport. So after this first game, the Princeton Rutgers contest, other East Coast schools began playing a similar game, first with Columbia University and uh, later other schools like Harvard and Yale, of course. Um, In 1873, representatives from Columbia, Princeton, Rutgers, Yale, et al. met to formalize rules. However, these rules were based mostly on soccer. Harvard, which uh, played a more rugby, you know, heavy style, more of a hard hit and just Bam! Line everybody up, and let's go mano a mano or, or team to team. You know, much like uh, sort of, sort of like those the old European style of warfare. You know, you just line people up and you go at it and watch people drop. <laughs> so Harvard, which played more of this rugby heavy style, refused to attend the meeting, continuing to play the game their way. Notably, in two contests against McGill University of Montreal. The two schools played essentially the same type of game with rugby-style rules, these heavy hits, including running with the ball, as Harvard slowly won over the other schools to its style of play and necessitated a new meeting to standardize new rules. That meeting, uh, known as the Massasoit Convention, created rules based largely on the Rugby Football Union Code. So right about here is where uh, Walter Camp enters the picture. He's considered the father of American football. He sort of enters the foray here. And at this moment, at this epoch, so to speak, is where we start seeing um, the game take shape into something more familiar. So Walter Camp, it was was in 1880 that the the sport really began uh, to take shape. Of course, um, thanks almost exclusively to one person, the aforementioned Walter Camp. He attended Yale University from 1876 to 1882, and as we all know, 
Uh, he was an avid athlete playing on Yale's violent football squad from 77 until he left the school around, uh, not around, but in 1882. He was also a fixture at the rules conventions, you know, participating heavily in these conventions, finally gaining traction with his ideas in 1880. It was then that the rules committee began to adopt his ideas, his rule changes, which included establishing the line of scrimmage, the exchange between a quarterback and a center, the awarding of six points for a touchdown and three points for a field goal, though it would take years to come to those exact numbers. Um, lowering, lowering the number of players to 11 and the concept of set plays, the stoppage, you know, and then come and then the huddle and then playing, you know, actually calling plays. Um, e- even after Camp left Yale as a student, he continued to coach the team and be a regular presence at every rules convention held until his death. Some of Camp's most significant contributions, however, came after he left the university. I mean, after leaving Yale. The first came in 1898 when Camp introduced the All-America team, a group of players he personally chose as being the best in college football. Camp had an All-America team every year from 1898 to 1924. And after that... All American teams continued to be named every year uh, to this day. One of the highest honors, actually, it remains to be one of the highest honors in college football. The second innovation was in 1906, though in this camp just played a minor role. Um, The game of football had spread beyond a few Ivy League schools by this time, traveling through New England and all the way into the Midwest. Um, However, the sport had also become much more violent, if you can picture that. It actually became more violent, um, especially because of mass plays, quote-unquote. Mass plays, just to let you know, featured every member of a side moving together to try to score. Um, To counter them, the defenses would do the same, resulting in these enormous mobs of, of just these two enormous mobs, these big, you know, units of people trying to tackle the ball carrier. Uh, one particular mass play called the Flying Wedge was particularly vicious. Ten of the 11 offensive players would form a wedge, while one player, the ball carrier, would move behind them before leaping over them to move the ball forward and attempt to score. Now, Walter Payton kind of comes to mind with this but just imagine Walter Payton diving over those, you know, Chicago Cubs offensive lines, but into a mob and not into an end zone, but being greeted by, you know, 11 refrigerator parries. <laughs> wow. I mean, it was just a train wreck uh, with this play, this, this, this wedge play. Um, as a countermeasure, the defense would send a man of his own leaping over colliding headfirst at times with the ball carrier in midair. Now, as you can imagine, injuries just plagued football games uh, as a result. Injuries were often the best outcome, in fact, of these plays. Um, In the 1905 season, 149 serious injuries were were recorded as uh, part of the sport, along with 18 deaths. Action just had to be taken, and various crimes, or rather various cries for reform. Can't really say crimes just yet, (laughs) because everyone agreed to uh, the rules of this game. Everyone knew, kind of knew what the outcome could be. So with 18 deaths, action had to be taken. December 8th, 1906, football leaders gathered in New York and voted to legalize the forward pass. The decision was in response to an uprising led by none other than President Roosevelt himself, who believed that the brutally violent game needed to change or be abolished altogether. Bet your bottom dollar that pioneers in manufacturing like the big game will respond with a revolutionary football of the future, engineered with the forward pass in mind. Yes, sir Tomorrow's footballs will be made consistently at the smallest size allowed by official football specifications. 